says, do not give up on your legal status. Many people fail to respond to RFE or file an application before the deadline. This is why we offer a strategy session for 15 minutes at no cost to you. Not everyone qualifies. First, you need to speak with our CARES team. We receive many requests, so we recommend you answer a few questions on our website, greencardguys.com. Our mission is to help people live and work in America legally. Go ahead and subscribe below and follow and share. Talk to you soon. <clears throat> What's going on today? We want to share some red flags, things you need to know about employment-based cases. And of course, there's a range of visas with that, that, about that. My name is John Ting. I practice immigration law in all 50 states of America, solving your immigration problem and hopefully prevent it from happening in the first place. Folks, today we're going to talk about those red flags, uh, give you some guidance, share some guidance on how you can take action on your case and maybe even not sponsor someone in the first place. So I'm here on uh, LinkedIn as well uh, because you may have you know, spoken or considered to speak to certain attorneys and you might not even know what to have ready. And sometimes it feels like, uh, especially if it's a uh, first time, first time sponsoring someone or even considering it, you might think it's, I don't want to say a waste of time in a consultation, but uh, at least on an attorney's perspective, we're ready to help you, right? Uh, if that person is eligible, of course. So part of our service includes a preliminary review to see if that foreign national is even um, what we call not inadmissible, all right? It uh, doesn't have a situation where there's reasons for the government, you United States government, USCIS, from uh, denying them, aside from the whole job position and things of that nature, okay? So that's part of our service, uh, part of our due diligence that I don't know if other law firms do that, um, but that's not, you know, that kind of, that part of due diligence is not necessarily part of the, for example, their legal requirements for, let's say, like L visa or E visa. Um, at the initial stage, step number one, being the petition. By the way, folks, I'm happy to answer any questions, regardless which platform you're on. Uh, you can comment down below your question. Uh, so I'll share some of the red flags, about five more minutes, and then I'll go into those answering those questions. Now, of course, there's limited time here. I've gone live 30 minutes to an hour before, but I tend to notice that I think it's already happening. I'm starting to lose my voice. So if you don't mind, uh, share the secret code so you can unlock access to this free 15 minute strategy session. Now, this free 15 minutes is not for everyone, but I want to share that access to y'all first on social media because you're, you're taking time out of your day to listen to us and see, um, see how we can help you, right? Uh, so here's the deal the secret code is fitness. Fitness, okay? Um, we have a theme this year of wellness, so and we just had a, a team meeting of um, doing some exercises and, and thinking about doing our, some little fitness exercise during the day. So that's very nice. Thanks, Maria. Appreciate that. And uh, what she's on here monitoring as well. Uh, so let's get down to it. Red flag or thing you need to know, number one, okay, is especially um, whether it's employment-based in terms of like – in a for residency or a visa, non immigrant visa, it's really paying attention to the job description. It does not, it cannot be your preferred qualifications, right? It cannot be that. You know, I have experience with this from volunteering with City of Dallas, the Civil Service Board. So I understand the government perspective is that we have to set minimum qualifications and anything that is basically industry standard. Okay, you can still adjust it to some extent, but you can't, you should not put your preferred qualification. If anything, that should be more internal. Okay, now, of course, it's for immigration purposes, all right? You're not, um, you're not doing anything wrong. It's just that, unfortunately, if you have any preferred qualifications, uh, things that you're looking for, it needs to be more of your interview panel, your interview process or screening process internally, okay? Okay. Um, but uh, the second thing is that related to the, this process of the, the job description is that, you know, people always ask, well, well, I'm, do I have to go through this recruitment process? And recruitment is required for employee-based residency. People call it, some people call it PERM. Um, is that, do I, I already know this foreign national that I want to sponsor. 
Do I still have to go through recruitment process? Yes, unfortunately you do. The Department of Labor does require that. So you need to conduct due diligence on that. You cannot skip any step related to the recruitment. Um, and there is a cooling off period of 30 days after that. Okay. So, and um, so it's very important that you do that because one of the requirements is a publication. So for example, on Dallas Morning News, it's going to be about $1,500 on average. At the end of the day, it depends on the number of characters, essentially the number of letters that's in the job posting. But you have to do it for two Sundays. All right. So some people, unfortunately, skip one of those steps. And publication is just one of them. But a lot of our, some of our clients ask, well, is this necessary? Look, at the end of the day, the things we're going to ask you to do it's not so much an ask, it's required. We're not going to ask you to do something that's not required by law. So it can kind of give you an idea about that. We wouldn't, it doesn't make sense for us to tell you to spend more money if you didn't have to do it. So just sharing with you all in case you, you maybe you, whoever's watching here, whether you're the foreign national or you're thinking about starting your own company, maybe you, maybe you want to sponsor someone in the future, or maybe you work in HR or something related to it. Like, I don't know how like sports teams call it, like director of personnel something like that. So uh, let's see here. The third, there's a lot to share, but the third one I can think of right now is um, people ask, when do I have to pay this candidate, this employee? And I, I inter interchange between employee and candidate because that person could be working for you already. But the question, right, the tip right now is, do I have to pay this person that prevailing wage that, you know, was step number one? And think of prevailing wages, um, basically the wage that Department of Labor sets as the minimum. So I don't really want to call it minimum wage, but you have to, yeah, you have to pay that wage, prevailing wage or above that. Okay. So people ask, do, do I have to start paying that right now during the process? And no, you actually don't even have to hire that person that you're sponsoring until um, there's the resident, the residency, basically the very last step when that person gets the resident card already can, has the interview um, either abroad or in the United States. Um, so those are the top three things you need to know for today. There's of course, a lot more questions happy to answer related to it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see here. So uh, we can go more into detail on other on items about that. If you have questions on that, but for now, I'm going to, um, but for anyone who is not familiar and you want to ask questions and I don't not able to answer in depth here, you want a little more um, strategy session on that, or I'm not able to answer your question at all, on LinkedIn and YouTube, you can see right here, there's the phone number, or you can go to our website, greencardguys.com, answer a few questions on there, go to the contact page, and uh, you'll receive an email. I'm trying to do something a little bit different. You'll receive an email, okay? Uh, well, after you complete the form, it's going to ask you to submit your, your email there. And you have to go to your email box to confirm subscription, basically, to receive future emails about our team, okay? And how we can help people, help you. Now, in that next email, you're going to receive a link for a calendar, okay? Basically, you can self-schedule an appointment, and our CARES team will call you within 24 hours, maybe sometimes the same day. So, but just in case, if you're at work or something and you want to DM us or text us in, just so you don't forget, because um, again, you might be busy or you might be driving. Some people have told me that. Please be safe, by the way. But if you're um, busy, just text in the code fitness. Okay. Text in the code fitness and our CARES team will prioritize. The benefit of that is our CARES team will prioritize your inquiry, your request for a consultation. Uh, so they can review your case facts first, okay? Keep in mind, they're not attorneys, but they do help us quite a lot to get you collect certain information that we need so that when you do have that consultation, uh, the attorneys, myself or our so premier associates, can assist you and confirm or whether you're eligible for a ben immigration benefit or not, okay? Um, which, of course, ultimately, we do share tips and strategy tips on, on that regard, Okay. All right, so I'm going to hop off LinkedIn for now. And let's see. I can remove. All right, so 
All right, so some questions here. Uh, Emily asked on YouTube, good day. Can I clarify a comment on AOS with green card holder spouse? This is foreign national who's being sponsored by GC spouse now for F1 category. They filed AOS pen package last week using the filing chart. Uh, and their lawyer saying that I-485 won't be denied. It will remain pending. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how that's possible. If the person overstayed their visa. Retrogression, yeah, retrogression is a completely different concept. It's not related to the, the main question that you have about whether you need to maintain status or not with lots of like a non-immigrant status. Let me see if I can share my screen. Here, um, USCIS, um, sorry, TikTokers, I'll get to y'all in, in about two minutes. I need to answer this question. Inapplicability of uh, bars to adjustment. <clears throat> I also want to share the other screen about page about the Visa Bulletin. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. All right, Emily, I'm coming to you soon. Emily, if you don't mind, maybe just share a video to your buddy, to your friend, because I know I appreciate your asking questions for your friend, but uh, maybe it's just, um, oh, you're saying didn't overstay, wasn't status with the filed, when filed. Okay. Yeah, that's still not going to help. I mean, I wish your friend the best, but let's share my screen now, okay? And I, hopefully I'm wrong, but that's typically, yeah, I've never seen it like this. Okay. They need to um, maintain a status. Well, you said didn't overstay, but they did overstay if they didn't maintain status. So let's get down to it. The first thing is the general overview. Okay. And applicability of bars to adjustment. So many people think, oh, I hear, always hear that a spouse is mar getting married to a citizen is the best thing. It's, and the reason it's the better option may not be better for you because you might not find the right match, and that's okay. Take your time. But the reason it is legally the best one is because it waives unlawful presence, okay? And so, but that does require you to enter the United States legally with a visa, any visa, it doesn't matter. It could be a tourist visa, B1, B2, F1, student visa, doesn't matter. Uh, the only caveat to that is a J1, if it's two-year restriction stamp on your passport. Talk about that at a different time. But essentially here, this is the USCIS policy manual, okay? Chapter Volume 7. This is a section that says all these typical adjustment restrictions or restrictions to uh, getting residency here, that we call that adjustment of status, is um, waived for these certain applications so y'all on tiktok you don't you don't you can't see my screen but i'm gonna still explain it to you all right so i'm on the uscs policy manual it's for vawa self petitioners and the beneficiaries children um immediate relatives so that includes spouse of a u.s citizen or parent who is being sponsored by the adult child over 21 u.s citizen so the most common one are these two the second one really is here listed is the applicant is not in lawful immigration status if um, on the date he or she files adjustment application. So um, you see that here. The key thing is on the date he or she files. So that's what you're thinking, uh, Emily, or maybe their attorney. You know, I could be wrong. You know, I could be wrong. I don't know everything. But that's also why, for good measure, I like to share the policy manual. Okay. So um, here it is. And it also says the applicant has ever failed to continuously maintain lawful status since entry into the United States. All right. So, um, yeah, but that's related to your friend, Emily. That is for someone, the spouse is a U.S. citizen, not a resident. So key difference. So I just share with you, that is the key difference of immediate relative classification versus a family preference classification. 
All right, so let's see here. <clears throat> yeah, so just keep that in mind because I've seen denial letters on the 485 that says, and it, it totally sucks too because you've been, some people can have waited all this time and then, and then may think to themselves, well, shoot, all this time I could have just filed the N400. So that's what I suggest to your friend. File the N400 when he or she is eligible to do that. Because some people, I've, I've seen it, the denial letters, and some people waited a year plus for the 45 decision. And then maybe they had an interview, which most people do when they wait that long. And then at the interview, the officer might not even say anything, which is even more frustrating. But then that person gets a denial letter saying, yeah, you didn't maintain your status. Sometimes people get a, sometimes people get an RFE and ask for that, right? You know, show me proof that you maintain your status. So I don't know what your friend's attorney is saying. Again, I could be wrong, but um, uh, yeah, hopefully she's not wrong. Uh, the attorney's not wrong, but yeah, that's kind of weird to me. Oh, okay, well, if you're saying uh, she's still on F1, then she's good, but when F1 expires, and this case still pending, that's a problem. So I still recommend that her, your friend's spouse becomes a U.S. citizen as soon as, as, soon as they can. Okay. Um, but yeah, Emily, if you want to, if anyone wants this link that I shared, text in a code. What would I call this? Text in this code um, bar. B A R. Then I can get we get a team member can send you a link to this, so that you can so for someone like Emily can share it with your friend, uh, because information that's that's why we have this channel, folks. Try to help you prevent immigration problems. So fortunately for Emily's friend, that person is still in some kind of status right now. All right. Um, uh, anyway, yeah, yeah, two forty five k exception, but that doesn't. That doesn't really help many people. That's only up to 180 days of unlawful um, unlawful presence. Okay, it's a it's a bit more complicated to discuss right now. Um, all right, so let me get down to the questions on TikTok here. Appreciate your patience. Let me turn on the light right here. You can see my armpit. Sorry. Okay. Uh, good thing I'm not wearing a tank top today. Okay, KD. What happens if a VAWA case gets denied in immigration court? Um, let's prevent that from happening. Okay. Hopefully you haven't had that situation already. Uh, we handle very limited removal cases on purpose, really because we only want to accept cases that we believe we can help people, right? If someone has an extensive criminal history, we're likely going to refer that out to another attorney to review that anyway. But, um, for VAWA, there's two things we can do. Well, first thing is prepare the VAWA application, I-360, and provide a copy to the Department of Homeland Security in the, for the purpose of trying to get your case dismissed in the first place. Now, I can't say for sure that that happens every time for someone who's applying for VAWA, but we've had success. We've had cases uh, dismissed, completely terminated, meaning you don't have to go back to court at all. All right. But you need, that's why I say step number one is that you need to file that application. Okay. Because they want to see proof of it. You don't just go to court. You know, this is my, early days of being a lawyer and observing other lawyers and throughout my career, of course, that, you know, I wonder if how I'm doing it is the best way, right? There's always so many different ways people are advocate for the clients, but I can tell you this, what I learned in law school for trial prep seminar is three words, prepare, prepare, prepare. Okay. So we want to show proof. Well, I guess a fourth one could be proof, show proof that we filed something because you go to court and, you know, especially when it was the uh, President Trump administration or even President Obama administration, um, they'll ask, well, what do you got for us? And some attorneys say, oh, I need more time to prepare. Like, cut that bullshit. Like, look, you know, we're fast. OK, we're fast. We work with you. Look, if, of course, you hired us like two days ago, that's a little bit different. We won't have that time. But most people don't get hired that last minute, okay? And, and you shouldn't hire someone last minute like that. If you want the best case scenario for yourself, do not wait till last week. I think someone called us yesterday. You got a court hearing. Someone got a court hearing on the 31st. What did my team member mes message? 
31st, eight days away, a little, little close, kind of close, but hey, that's okay. Especially if you already tried to talk to other lawyers and you just didn't like their vibe. I get it. But um, anyways, I'm going in a long spiel here about that. As you can tell, I love sharing information. So I got to stop my answer for that question. So give us a call. Okay, Katie, I, I know I recognize your username. You've asked a couple of questions before, but it sounds like you could take advantage of one of our consultations. Okay, uh, let's see here. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Anupa, your friend's green card is processing on VAWA. Can you apply for travel document? Uh, yes, if your friend filed a 45 and that was based on marriage to a U.S. citizen or another immediate relative category. Okay, yeah, if GC is approved, then you don't need a travel document. Okay, oh, by the way, hot tip here, folks. After you finally receive that coveted resident card the green card which is not green anyway by the way it's i think it's blue if i remember correctly um but anyway the when you finally get it and you think maybe you're looking for another job or your current job says okay great you got the green card we're gonna send you abroad to work outside the united states and you're like you're like awesome finally after all these years finally i'm gonna go abroad and work cool well you gotta do a couple you gotta do one thing at least Two things. Tell your boss that don't send you abroad until you get an I-131 reentry permit approved. I see it time and time again that people are like, people go abroad and it's not necessarily a pandemic's concern that they couldn't come back. You know, most people it's work or because they have family that live back in their home country and they're, that family member sick. But for those people that say, oh, my work told me to work abroad, cut the bullshit, okay? You got to take advantage of your status and don't lose the status. The key issue legally is that you don't want to abandon your status, okay? So if you're going for work and it's been more than six months, you're going to have a tough time, okay, trying to come back in. You might get lucky to come back in through customs at the airport. And no, I don't know which airport would be better to arrive back in. I've asked that question before. I have no idea because even if someone was successful to get right through Slick right through, slip right through. Uh, that doesn't mean you're going to get the same customs officer, right? So um, you just got to think about that, folks. When you get that coveted green card, know your plan, know your future plan. Or even if it's your travel, and you're like, y'all, I'm just going to chill out in Barbados. I'm going to chill out in the island. Do you, okay? Do you. But have a plan in place first in terms of your legal status. Just because you get the green card doesn't mean it's over. OK, you got to apply for something else called the reentry permit. It's a form that many of y'all know right now in 131. And yes, you do have to, OK, wait because you have to get the bio, you have to do the biometrics. And who knows, they might reuse your prints, but, you know, wait at least another month or two because they're going to send that ASC notice for biometrics, most likely. And uh, yeah, just just keep that in mind, folks. I just feel bad for everyone that's got residence status. Some of y'all got it for like ten years, and you've been out for two years, and it's just gonna be it's gonna be a tough cookie to come back in. Okay, it's gonna be a struggle. All right, so I would hate for you to have to restart the process. Which, by the way, if you do get back in, okay, if you do get lucky to slip right through customs legally, then they put you to secondary inspection or whatnot. They're going to try to make it difficult, okay? And they're going to give you a form that says 407 at the top in the title of Abandonment of Residence Status. Do not sign it. I repeat, do not sign that 407 form. If they change a number and I say the wrong number, I know what the number is because under Trump administration, all of us knew this now. But regardless... You read it. They're not going to explain it to you. They might, but it's not their job to explain it, okay? You read it, and especially if you have a parent who has residence status, you need to explain this to them, okay, in your native language or whatever. Explain it to them because especially people who are from raised in different countries that are not from America, obviously. I can say this at least from like Asian, East Asian countries. We tend, our culture, we tend to be... Um, trying to use it to find a different word we try we tend to be um we just 
whatever the government official says, we just listen to it, right? So as you know from the Trump administration, some of these officers, regardless of agency, they say a lot of bullshit, okay? I don't like to curse, but sometimes I got to curse so y'all get the point, all right? So do not sign that form because they will they will say, okay, fine, you're going to go deferred inspection, you're going to go in secondary inspection for additional questioning. Let them do that. Secondary inspection is not technically a jail, okay? It's not technically a jail. You're not been arrested. You're not going to be put in handcuffs, okay? Make it difficult for them because technically a judge, an immigration judge is officially the person who's supposed to revoke your resident status. So if you want to buy some time and you've been able to slip through customs legally speaking, then uh, not jumping the turnstile in that sense, don't sign that form, okay? See, again, I have a long answer for um, – for a question, I'm going to kind of try to keep it shorter. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll do short videos on that, by the way. Bernalou, how long for perm? My green card is like going on two years now. Yeah, perm. So perm, perm, people use that term loosely, but perm specifically is more for the labor certification phase or step. And that is average eight months. But in general, the EB process, except the last part where it's the visa, uh, depending on the visa bulletin because that depends on your country and nationality but the other than that step for residency but everything else i would say yeah at least two years okay at least two years and especially if you're eb2 from like india or china or eb3 and you're from that, those two countries at least that's um it's had retrogression that means the prior date went backwards so that's uh that affects people unfortunately so it could take longer um Hopefully that gives you an idea. <clears throat> uh, Malamar, um, Malamari, hello. Does USCS scrutinize my application? Take a longer time to process. If you're a national of Syria, apply for AOS through marriage. If so, when can I sue? Um, great question. In general, the U.S. government does tend to discriminate, hold cases when someone is from a country of, from the Middle East, okay, in Pakistan um, and China, okay, especially with the whole spy balloon thing. It's freaking ridiculous what happened, politically speaking. So even though nine, post 9-11, that was in 2001, we're now in 2023. God, God bless our military and everyone who's helped support the cause of uh, taking down those terrorists and continuing that effort. But in terms of immigration, it's ridiculous. Okay, you know they keep <clears throat> they keep saying that it's that it's um, that it's necessary essentially to continue doing these background checks. Okay, and some people might think, well, of course, background checks are important. Yeah. But why does it take like some people one year, two years, and inherently, just like any company, the government forgets people. They forget certain cases. So unfortunately, some people do have to sue USCIS or State Department, the embassy or consulate to get their case resurrected, get it moving again. Okay. Even for example, I remember we filed a lawsuit against on the fiance visa petition. It turns out because we asked to get an idea of why it was a delay, and I think they've been waiting almost two years, unfortunately, uh, because the petitioner had a crime, but it wasn't a crime that is supposed to delay the case. So think of it like a train track. A train is supposed to go in, a, let's say, the left direction, but it went right when it should have went left or it just got stuck. stuck, uh, stuck. So uh, just think of a mandamus lawsuit to resurrect and push it to the correct direction in that sense. Um, let's see. Okay, TikTok. Oops, sorry, Maria. I missed that one. Trying to give everyone love on... Uh... So Malamari, contact us. Okay, so we can understand what, what, what stage you're at and what the timing is, and we can advise you appropriately. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, user, what is present time for adjustment status via 
U.S. citizen son. So U.S. citizen son, meaning over 21, is um, I meaning is on average an adjustment status. It's on average about 12 months. You know, they tend, I don't know why, but they USCIS tends to approve cases more quickly uh, in 2023 when it's a marriage-based case. So yours is still a potential. Yours is still immediate relative classification, which is great, but I would say average 12 months. Okay, I don't know specifically for Oregon. Uh, and you might not even have an interview, so uh, even clicking on Oregon might not matter or checking it. <clears throat> All right, let's see here. Uh, back to, let's see, USCIS approved your sister, I-130, by, mist ooh, by mistake, by using someone else's receipt number, her information. Um, okay, I would double, ch like, submit an inquiry on that, because, yeah, you definitely, because ultimately, well, what to expect after that is about maybe three weeks to a month, she's going to receive a e an email They've upgraded. They started emailing instead of mailing in the paper notice from the National Visa Center. But you'll get a new case number. So if the new case number, the first three digits, or I'm sorry, the first three letters is related to the consulate or embassy. So if you, if it's completely different than what uh, your, your sister put in on the petition, or whoever the petitioner is, then, then that's a clear idea, clear fact that they got the wrong person. So... Um, and so especially in that situation, you would submit inquiry. Um, I don't know if they have a specific option for that, but <clears throat> if anything, worst case scenario, call the chat with Emma. Hey, Emma is back. Emma, I saw Emma the other day on the website chat. She's back. So maybe try that instead of calling in because calling in seems to be a headache sometimes. All right, Miss A, processing time for I-130 is five weeks. What does that mean? It means nothing, unfortunately. All right, I'm sorry, Miss A. Hey, it'd be great. I hope I'm wrong. But to be honest, everyone that has a call with us, a strategy session, they say, hey, you know, just let you know online, my USCS account says two weeks, five weeks, one month, whatever the hell it is, it's wrong. Because by the time I say, well, when was the first time that you got that notification or you saw it? They're like, oh, like they, whatever they say, they say, oh, more time than actually it showed online. So, I just know you got to think about it. Look, if USCIS was that advanced at technology, you would think the processing times would be more accurate. Okay. Or if they were that precise that on the processing timetable, when they put people, people put in the inquiry date or receipt date to know when to submit an inquiry, that wouldn't it be nice to just know, okay, your, your case set up for interview. Like well, it's August 23rd. Now maybe they could say like, Oh, September 5th. You know, that would be nice, but it just seems a little weird. Like, I think they're just working out the system. This is new in the last 30 days to two months. So give us some more time. Maybe whatever I say now. So if you're watching this video a year from now, I could be wrong at the time that you watch this video. I could be wrong. So I hope so, but I doubt it based on the current experience so far. Uh, DAC expired two years ago. Are you in trouble? Oh, yeah, possibly, but um, you want to check the USCS page to see if, um, yeah, usually they usually try to re treat that as a new applicant. And so if you file yourself, or this is what we would do in our cover letter, okay, on top of the forms, we would mention when you were, uh, when you last were approved, of course, and then to try to treat it as a renewal and not a new applicant. Um, so, yeah, start with that, okay? Hopefully that helps. You did your 693. That's a medical exam. What's included in a sealed envelope? This is a 693 form. Um, this is the form. So if you just Google search it, we, when people sign up, we include that form on our Dropbox folder. But uh, do not open it, okay? You need to provide it to USCIS. And I'm assuming you got it now. Uh, well, I don't know if you got it as a courtesy uh, letter from USCS, but assuming you didn't file it at all, you want to provide the sealed envelope. It's your medical exam uh, results, the 693. I think it's always a good idea to ask the medical clinic a copy of it 
because you cannot open that sealed envelope. If you open it and then reseal it, they know because I think I think there's some kind of special special tape. So, but they can tell. So, you, because the the end they they want to make sure because the medical exam is for health grounds and admissibility. So they don't want you to mess with it because if you open it, but let's say you didn't actually you know you didn't like mark anything out or anything. They just want it to be authentic as possible. It's kind of like in criminal law, chain of custody. They want to make sure the piece of evidence, like a knife or a gun, didn't get touched in a, by someone else, essentially. Okay? So same thing with the medical exam. But yeah, in general, if you just want to look online, just Google search 693 USCIS and it'll pop up. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Emily, uh, do they process different EAD at different process times? Yes. Depends on the category. I have no idea why you would think they just like, just, just freaking rubber stamp that. Like, I don't know. Like, it's just ridiculous. The only thing I would think is the background check, but still like, it's just stupid. In my opinion, it shouldn't be that long. Uh, user Amadi, how long to get an asylum interview? Ooh, that's tough. Um, it's like almost every six months that like USCS changed the policy for some time earlier this year. They said, okay, most recent that filed, um, we'll be get a, we'll get an interview sooner. But I think they backtracked on that because of course people that filed a long time ago, many years ago, uh, would be frustrated. I would be. So we actually filed a lawsuit um, uh, for people who filed an asylum application many years ago. Sometimes seven years, four years. Four years, we prefer as our minimum. If you waited at least four years, then we file a lawsuit. Uh, then you could get in your interview in about, depending on the asylum office. Um, I know that San Francisco asylum office this year, when we sued earlier this year, we got an interview date for um, actually later this month. So, um, but yeah, we sued earlier. So it was about an eight month wait time for him, him or her, right? But when we but in other parts of the country, I think there's only five asylum offices. But so it's very limited, unfortunately. But anyway, um, in general, if you were to file your own separate, like have not filed at all yet, and you're just not filing your asylum application, yeah, I would say, I would say probably several years for an interview. But don't hold your tongue on it. If you get an earlier date, you want to make sure you have a lawyer to help prepare you for the interview. Because I hate to say this, People who don't have a lawyer, especially for asylum, and I think they have a pretty decent claim. I mean, your chances are always better in general. Anything in law related, your chances are always better when you have a lawyer, right? Of course, I can't guarantee outcome for that lawyer for you, but I mean, if you don't, you don't do this stuff every day. It's like any other job. So, anyway, just hate for you someone to get an interview and then get denied at the interview, or not at the interview, but afterwards when you have a legitimate claim or seem like a strong claim by the way uh, this is a good time to mention um if you don't mind if you appreciate the way we share information i know i might be a little bit fast spitting out answers but i, I feel like i have to there's so many questions but if you don't mind or you already spoke with a cares team specialist on our team go to review tinglaw.com www.reviewtinglaw.com i greatly appreciate it and mean the world to our team and especially if you did talk with one of our team members Please mention that. Okay, please mention that in the... Uh, so down here on YouTube, I'm sharing the link below. All right. Uh, because they do get bonus... Our team members do get bonuses at the end of the year. All right, Mo, you apply for U-Visa 918. Okay, all those forms in August 22. When you should expect the uh, EAD. So um, you're supposed to get a bona fide de a letter that says bona fide determination if you haven't, which you may likely have not received it because uh, we've been suing the government. There are lawsuits. Uh, the other attorneys I know have been suing um, for the delay on this letter, okay? Because ultimately, not getting this letter means a delay on your work permit, the EAD, applying for it. So hopefully that helps, which before, all the years before, doesn't matter red or blue, before, you, people were not able to apply for work permit after filing for UV, so you had to wait a much longer time. Okay, is AOS, you're doing AOS, you receive a combo card, what happened if you're denied when you're out 
when you're out of the country? Um, I, I don't know what you mean by that. I mean, I need more information. Like, why do you think you'll be denied in the first place, user 86? Um, I, I can share a lot of information. So I need a, little, I really need a follow up question on that one, okay, or facts. Okay, so there are, it's 12.43 right now, Central Time. So I could probably answer two more questions. Okay, Maria, two more. It's more than I usually would, would offer now. Um, it's a good time to share if you're interested in a consultation strategy session at no cost to you. This is the phone number right here. Okay, if you want to call in, 720-740-4247. Go to, or, or go to our website, greencardguys.com. Click on contact us and you'll get your uh, answer a few questions and you'll get an email with the link to self schedule appointment. Okay. Um, but in general, our cares team will try to call you within 24 hours to, uh, to assist you. All right. Um, a, you got 765 C C9. Can you travel outside U S um, that, that kind of question about traveling, it's more about, it's more about, you know, do you have any crimes, things like that? It's kind of complicated to answer, to be honest. But if does some, you know, Manka Wood, all of our class have C9 in AOS, no crimes, no arrest, no criminal history, no plea bargain, then yeah, they've been able to come back. So uh, leaving is not the issue. No one's going to stop you. Okay. They don't care. They can care less. But it's about coming back in. To the U.S. Okay, that's when they would check your your documentation. Okay, the travel document, the 131 or combo card. Okay, so hopefully that helps. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. I have a question uh, about tax. I believe. Okay, Sherelle. Sherelle's question will be the last for now, okay? And then we'll see you all live tomorrow. But the question is, can a can an immigrant marry to a citizen who is not paying tax? So I think you mean, if I understand correctly, that you're saying the U.S. citizen is not paying tax? Uh, that's okay if that's legally true, like you don't need to pay tax. Maybe you not didn't meet the threshold for income. But if that's true then that's a problem, right? You need a sponsor who can um, legally appropriately you know, exceed the minimum poverty guidelines. Okay, the eight sixty four p chart, you Google search that to see. And then the, in the middle of the, the middle column has a, uh, as for people who are in active duty in the military, but to the right, most people are gonna be on the right column. So it's a little bit higher on that sense that you need a joint sponsor, okay? We have a video about that, something about poverty guidelines or something, sponsor. After they have support on our YouTube channel. So if you go to greencardguys.tv or just text in, text in 864 if you want that video. Okay. Nick, we can um, uh, we can send it to you. Okay. Text in 864 if you want that video. <clears throat> All right, folks. If you don't mind, tap the screen on TikTok uh, down below on YouTube. Please. Give us a thumbs up. We greatly appreciate it, okay? Thank you so much. And again, I, I try my best to answer as many questions as possible and as succinctly as possible. I think that's a key thing. There's so much to share, but I try to make it as brief and well, so, as succinct as possible in a short amount of time. Okay, one more question. Uh, so real. So real, what's up? Good to see you. I hope you're safe. Um, I hope you and Brian are safe, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, K1, so give an idea. Well, everything's confidential, so I can't share everything for about surreal situation, but pending AOS um, in general, C9 category is going to take at least five months in general. But So you're not under K1 right now, but, um, I mean, you're, you're about to get to the next step to file AOS. So, uh, yeah, your wedding's on Saturday. Amazing. Okay. I think you're in, uh, you're in the, you're in the deep South. Okay. So I think that's what Brian's email said. So, okay. Be safe. We'll be in touch. Okay. All right. Y'all have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Tap the screen. See ya.